This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Focusing, as she said, on uh, the infrarenal, mostly infrarenal with, with a little uh, foray into the juxtarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm and repair. Uh, don't really have any disclosures pertinent to this. I do run a course for type 2 endo leaks, uh, primarily utilizing transcable uh, aortic access. Um, so the brief overview is going to be uh, just a little um, background on the natural history and current indications and treatment options for elective and triple triple AAA. Uh, we'll discuss the open versus EVAR outcomes, uh, look at some of the decision make making for EVAR and the challenges inherent to anatomy. Um, and then also kind of uh, dip into how this changes for juxtarenal pathology. So again, just to start with the natural history of aneurysms, the obligatory background stuff. <laughs> uh, aneurysms are focal dilation of the aorta that exceeds uh, one and a half times normal with uh, the expected diameter, uh, one and a half times the normal expected diameter, which translates to about three centimeters in a male a uh, patient, three, three and a half or so would be considered aneurysmal. Uh, this translates to 4.7% of all males and 1.2% of all females greater than 65 year old, uh, years old that have an aneurysm. And as we know, uh, a, a pretty good number of patients are diagnosed annually in the US, um, approximately uh, just over 100,000. Uh, most of these are in the abdominal aorta with about 95% of these classified as infrarenal. Um, and then uh, they're dotted throughout the rest of the aorta with about 3% thoracic, a little less than 2% are iliac. However, uh, uh, we'll discuss how iliac aneurysms also have a higher prevalence for having abdominal aortic aneurysms as well. Uh, and then only a, a small uh, proportion of those, less than 1% are actual thoracoabdominal aneurysms. Obviously, this is what an aneurysm looks like. This is a nice one. We don't usually see those that nice. Um, the risk factors and growth uh, uh, for AAAs include age, male sex, family history, smoking. Those are kind of the hot ones, um, but also would have to include atherosclerosis uh, and other uh, peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, Caucasian race, and a patients with a family or other, other aneurysms. Um, that's about a 5% growth rate per year. I typically tell patients in a percentage because as we know, the rate of growth increases with the diameter. Um, but if you wanted to translate that to an actual um, uh, millimeters, it's about four millimeters a year for an expected growth rate. Uh, however, the rate of growth is not necessarily, linear, not necessarily linear over time and can have sporadic staccato jumps or not grow at all between surveillance scans. And we also know the rupture risk increases with diameter, uh, with rapid expansion, with smoking, with hypertension, transplant history, COPD, and female sex. And the natural history is to expand and rupture. There's no medical therapy for aneurysms. Uh, about 11 or 12% of all aneurysms present already ruptured, um, and the mortality with rupture is very high, uh, upwards of 80%. Uh, representing about 15,000 deaths annually and is about the 13th, somewhere around the 10th to the 13th uh, leading cause of death in the USA. So elective surgery is therefore a prophylactic operation because these are usually asymptomatic uh, until the point where they rupture. So that was all of that fun background stuff. Now on to workup and decision making. So we're not going to usually uh, be the ones that are the first ones seeing uh, patients with aneurysm. So we're usually not the ones diagnosing them. They come to us on imaging uh, predominantly. But if you do happen to uh, be the first line of a patient, the abdominal exam examination is obviously going to include your uh, palpating for a uh, AAA. They're only palpable about a third of the time, however, and depending upon, and that's all dependent upon the size, the location, and the patient's body habitus. Um, imaging uh, usually can find on ultrasound um, as a start, but imaging is typically required for the actual diagnosis unless the patient is very thin or frail. Uh, but if you do palpate an aneurysm, it's usually in the epigastrum or the mid-abdomen, and you can use deep manipulation to check for tenderness for symptomatic patients. And iliac aneurysms are harder to detect, and usually in the lower quadrants, just because of the pelvic anatomy. <clears throat> 
You always need to include a popliteal and a femoral artery exam, however, because uh, of the uh, correlation with those. Uh, up to 14% of patients have popliteal or femoral aneurysms. Usually we'll quote the patients of about a 5% risk of having popliteal if they're diagnosed with an abdominal AAA. The converse, however, is not true in about 50% or up or actually upwards of 65 patients with a popliteal triple uh, with a popliteal aneurysm will also have an abdominal AAA. But a prominent pulse in the popliteal fossa warrants investigation. Um, as that can be a limb threatening and may, may end up being the, uh, uh, the aneurysm that you choose to fix first. Abdominal aneurysms, excuse me, abdominal ultrasounds also necessary for peripheral aneurysms because of the um, uh, correlation of popliteal and femoral artery aneurysms, as I mentioned. So then on to AAA imaging. So if you find a patient with a pulsatile abdominal mass or peripheral or thoracic aneurysms, you always want to screen them then. Uh, for a AAA. The higher risk individuals are going to include male smokers age greater than 75, female smokers uh, age greater than 70, and patients with a family history of AAA and greater than 55 years of age. Usually ultrasound might be your initial diagnosis um, unless the patient is very obese and then they might need to get a CT scan for the initial screening as well. Speaking of screening, so there is a, uh, some role in just screening patients that are high risk. And as we all know, the Medi welcome to Medicare exam is when uh, we've tagged patients in the United States for their screening exam. But this only includes men who have smoked at least 100 cigarettes uh, during their life and men or women with a family history of AAA. And that's, again, done on their welcome, welcome to Medicare, so at their 65th uh, birthday there. Regardless of uh, your choices for uh, repair versus surveillance when a AAA is diagnosed, uh, you always want to make sure the patient is medically optimized and your goals of optimization would be to reduce the expansion of aneurysm diameter. And this is predominantly going to include smoking cessation, treatment of hypertension, treatment of hypercholesterolemia, and I include statin therapy on that. Uh, then there may be a role of beta blockers and other uh, medical uh, things that may suppress MMPs. However, all those are experimental. Uh, and then you also wanna kind of optimize a patient for a potential operative procedure. This may include uh, cardiac risk stratification, such as a stress test if you're considering open repair. Beta blockers have essentially uh, gone out of favor as something you would initiate um, uh, due to uh, literature that's come out and uh, potentially consider whether or not you would uh, treat a patient with an ACE inhibitor. And I say that with a caveat as the uh, SVS guidelines uh, don't necessarily endorse that yet. So when are we gonna repair patients and how are we gonna choose to repair that? So you wanna make sure that your uh, surgical decision-making includes the patient for one, uh, but you have to take into account their operative risk, their, res their rupture risk, which is typically uh, based on diameter uh, with a, a, a line about their life expectancy as well. So the annual risk of rupture for abdominal aortic aneurysms uh, less than five and a half centimeters is very low, and this uh, kind of uh, harkens back to the old data uh, from the randomized control trials initiated uh, in the UK. Um, however, once you get above five and a half centimeters, that's when the rupture risk starts to increase. Um, I think that the 9% number is probably a little bit in inflated between five and six centimeters um, uh, due to statins and other medical therapies. However, um, that's currently kind of what the uh, best data we have shows. So the Society for Vascular Surgery Practice Guidelines uh, for Abdominal Aortic Aneurysm says to repair a patient if they're greater than five and a half centimeters and a low surgical rest patient, women between five and 5.4 centimeters, anybody with a saccular aneurysms and the diameter for this is not necessarily very uh, defined at all in the guidelines. And patients with small aneurysms um, that are going to need to be undergoing chemotherapy, radiation, or solid organ transplant because they may be at a higher risk of rupture. Our options for repair are obviously open or endovascular, and we can get into those a little bit. Open surgical repair is obviously the tried and true gold standard. It was developed in 1951. We know there's a, a perioperative mortality rate between 2 and 8 percent with complication rates up to 60 percent. The risk factors uh, in a patient that would make them at higher risk for complication uh, include chronic kidney disease, CHF, 
coronary vascular and coronary artery disease, COPD, uh, increased age, female gender. And then I added in low surgeon or hospital volume and lack of formal fellowship training in vascular surgery. And again, that, that also kind of goes with the volume that you, uh, that you experience in training. And we're showing that those are decreasing over time. So this may be an issue in years to come. Endovascular aortic aneurysm repair is the other alternative. So this can be done uh, under different types of anesthesia. Uh, it's probably a shorter procedure, probably has a lower uh, uh, EBL. It depends on your hospital protocols. You may avoid an ICU stay. And typical discharge home is post-op day one. Uh, and there's actually national thresholds uh, that mandate that you're supposed to have a less than two day hospital stay uh, for EVARs as far as reporting standards. All right, so the mandatory background data uh, for this, and I'll try not to be a huge data dump on this, uh, but this is my background. So uh, the, all of the randomized control trial, again, uh, initiated in the UK. Um, initially, these are all done in the late 90s. EVAR1 and the DREAM are the best uh, known, and they show a perioperative mortality. Uh, benefit to the tune of 3% for endovascular uh, repair versus open repair. And again, this is as this technology was being developed and as it was evolving and the technology was improving as well. Late survival, however, was shown to be similar. So out to four years, the EVAR1 data showed that late survival, the perioperative, per, so the perioperative mortality benefit was lost over time. And as you got into the two to four year range, uh, the curves came together and then were parallel from that, that point on. And then expanding all that data out to eight years as well, the same thing, both the aneurysm related survival as well as the endovascular, I mean, as well as the overall mortality uh, and survival were the same uh, after, after you got out to a specific point. And DREAM mirrored this as well uh, using their seven year data, these curves came together. So overall, in addition uh, of any other randomized control trials to this data shows uh, that overall, there's really not much of a, a long-term mortality benefit to EVAR. Uh, however, there is the perioperative benefit. So that was just the randomized control trials. What about the real world? And if you get that reference, you're really old like me. So the Medicare data and the nationwide inpatient sample in the US, obviously we have the benefit of having uh, kind of what actually is happening. This is all retrospective, but it's, it's pretty large numbers compared to the RCTs. Uh, and using the data, but in the early uh, uh, portion of the century, we were able to look at um, pretty large numbers of patients and compare the perioperative uh, outcomes. And these essentially mirrored the randomized control trials. So showing uh, a pretty good mortality benefit in the perioperative uh, period for EVAR versus open. And then using the Medicare data, however, when you look to these out uh, long term, you see again, the curves come together. And so it loses the perioperative uh, mortality benefit of about four years for Medicare data. However, there is uh, an age dependent benefit whereby older patients benefit more from EVAR and for a longer duration. So that goes into your decision making process. So the overall conclusions can be that there's the early mortality benefit that's lost in follow-up. However, the elderly benefit longer from EVAR and there's no survival benefit overall. But the question is, uh, remains, why is there no survival benefit? Uh, one thought would be due to rupture. The rates for rupture uh, in the RCTs were 1.8% for EVAR versus 0.5% for open four-year data. So not huge numbers, but it still can a uh, difference between the two. Reintervention risks, we obviously know are higher for EVAR compared to open. However, there's also a reintervention in, the, in an open fashion from hernias and um, bowel occlusions, et cetera, from open that may not be captured in some of that data. And then just overall survival of the fittest, as, you, as we showed in the EVAR1 trial data, the long-term, that aneurysm related survival versus overall survival, um, the curves uh, took a little bit longer to come together for the overall survival compared to just the aneurysm related survival. So a little bit of a difference there. <laughs>
So where have we gone in the U.S.? Obviously, uh, endovascular repair uh, met and then eclipsed uh, the numbers for open repair in 2004 and 2005. So for all the trainees, you probably don't remember that there was ever a time when open repair was this prevalent. And now we're probably doing about 80 to 90 percent EVAR in the United States these days. Um, however, uh, the overall effect of kind of switching to EVAR was that even though there's maybe not a long-term mortality benefit, we are moving the needle and the aneurysm-related deaths in the era of endovascular repair are decreasing overall, both from ruptures and just uh, intact coming along. All right, so that was all the hard fun stuff. Now onto the toys. And we get to talk about all the EVAR devices uh, and their current indications and limitations both. And I say limitations with a caveat, because a lot of the limitations, and, and this is something that I've experienced as I've gone through my training, um, things that used to be limitations are no longer just because of technology advances and different technique advances that we've undergone. So the EVAR beginnings, 1990, it dates back to Juan Perotti. He implanted the first endograft using a surgeon modified. He actually created this himself on a and Dr. Alozi will know uh, all this uh, story from the Sinai days. Um, but then he came into uh, the U.S., uh, to New York, uh, to help uh, Dr. Marin do a procedure um, in a patient that was, quote unquote, unfit for open repair uh, due to severe COPD. Since then, uh, the EVAR technology rapidly expanded. Um, initially, it was performed in older patients with greater comorbidities. However, um, as the technique uh, became uh, adapted at academic centers, it made its way into the community, and then it kind of became the treatment of choice uh, in almost the whole population. So the mechanism of EVAR is obviously different than the mechanism of open repair. Uh, and you spend a lot of time talking to a patient about this, but they never truly understand because they think they're going in for a fix, a, a surgical repair, and they don't quite realize that the mechanism is the crux of, of why EVAR may fail eventually. Uh, and so you have to explain that, uh, you know, EVAR is based on the tenets of proximal seal uh, and fixation. And this is in two different mechanisms. There's active and uh, potentially passive fixation as well. Uh, but essentially, it's really dependent upon the proximal and that distal seal. All of the devices right now, this includes some of the more uh, older generations of the devices as well, um, but it's something that you should all know um, for when you're looking at uh, routine follow-up scans. And then when you get new patients into your practice and they had an EVAR uh, way back when, you need to know how to recognize which device is which because of the failure mechanisms of these. So they're all based on uh, some important tenets. Usually there are two or three pieces uh, to get from the renal to the hypogastrics and a modular uh, mechanism. Uh, most of them uh, have a spiral support mechanism right now for flexibility. Uh, and again, this is all stuff that has changed over time um, uh, due to failure modes that were uh, discovered um, during a, a patient follow-up. Most have active fixation either by suprarenal or infrarenal um, hooks or stents. And then radial force has a role as well in the seal. Um, however, it also has been implicated in possibly having a role in ongoing aortic neck degeneration and potentially now uh, iliac degeneration uh, with the bell bottom limbs. So this is a busy table, but um, as a trainee, you need to know these numbers. Um, you don't necessarily have to have them all memorized because they do actually change over time as the devices um, uh, gain a little bit uh, increased uh, uh, indications and they change diameters, et cetera. Um, but the important things are that you need to, you know, an appropriate neck diameter, an appropriate neck length, which as you see varies. It used to be 15 across the board for all of the endovascular devices. However, um, now we're starting to move the needle and uh, allow for a shorter neck. Um, however, I'll go over the limitations of some of that later. Neck angulation, iliac diameter, iliac length. Um, the access um, that uh, is required for both the main body and the contralateral uh, limb are also important. And you need to know that when you're deciding between devices. 
And there's one caveat in the neck angulation and the neck length um, for the Medtronic Endurance um, has been able to decrease the neck length requirement on their AFU on their IFU, excuse me, um, uh, due to their um, uh, the endo anchors uh, with the hill effects. So um, that's something that's changed the game as well. So off-label use, so that was all the on-label use potentially. Um, however, off-label use is now done. And I think as, as the devices have matriculated in the community and um, interventionalists, I say that with a little bit of a caveat, interventionalists have started um, doing EVAR more, uh, more readily. I think that uh, we're seeing a lot more off-label use uh, with potential for different uh, mechanism, mechanisms of failure. I think that most of us, when we do an off-label um, device, we're really cognizant of, of how we're doing this and, and we know the te device technology and the limitations. Um, and so I would hope that we would all have good outcomes. However, this is not necessarily a phenomenon that you'll see across the United States with all providers. So off-label use though has been studied. Um, and in general, we think that there's probably an increased risk of type 1 endo leaks when uh, a device is used off-label. And that's just apropos to the device specifications. There has been some uh, evidence, though, that, again, in the highly selected patients that you can probably achieve pretty good outcomes even when using out, uh, out, uh, off-label device uh, use. So when you decide on how to do a patient uh, for EVAR, the 10 keys to success, uh, as reported at our institution, is patient selection and case planning. Those are kind of all the things that you need to know. So how to start looking at these. You obviously want to look at the axial images, but most of the time we're going to do a three-dimensional reconstruction and get a little bit more information in a centerline reconstruction. And that it both gives you an accurate diameter as well as allows you really to plan uh, for your seal zone and, and decide uh, which device is the best for a patient's anatomy. For the most part, I think most of my partners all do uh, kind of a Ready, ready-made artistic mock-up. Most of us don't have a very good uh, uh, artistic hand, but we do what we can. And we always go into the operating room with these. And this is going to also include our gantry angles, um, all of our devices that we've chosen, and then little nuances that we need to remember for a patient's anatomy. All of the companies have different sizing sheets and you can uh, learn their methods. Some do outer diameter, some based on inner, inner diameter, some need uh, um, you know, different measurements than others. So become familiar with all of these uh, different nuances. And I would say never rely on your rep. They're gonna do a really good job at doing the sizing for you, but you really need to learn this and know it and how to do it because you'll really learn uh, as you do it, the different device specifications um, again, failure things, things that you can get away with and can't get away with with a different device. Um, and you, you need to know how to do this yourself rather than relying on your reps to just bring the device that you need based on a CD that you gave to them. So my camera roll typically looks like this with a lot of different pictures along the way of aortas. The anatomic challenges, I think, are the most important thing to be cognizant of when you're looking at uh, EVARs. So this is something that we hammer into our fellows and make sure that uh, we all kind of are understanding. And I think in case conference, this is probably the thing that we talk about most. Um, so different challenges as we, we see, again, some of these have gone by the wayside to a slight degree as technologies improved and the device specifications have improved, but to start, uh, we would have the delivery challenges. So obviously this is just a, a, a mock-up of the open versus EVAR as it used to be done with um, uh, bilateral groin incisions and then percutaneous. Um, however, you do need to have an, end, uh, an external iliac artery that can tolerate the device. Um, and so you, nobody wants to end up with an iliac on a stick. And that's uh, where the, the device has gone through some modifications. However, uh, there's only so far that the devices can go because most of the space in a delivery system is fabric. And so it's really crunched in there already. So there's probably not too much more headway that can be made with uh, the delivery profile, although the, the 
they have decreased in the past few years. Um, excuse me, but the thin with the thinner the fabric goes, it may not necessarily show that uh, it's going to withstand the test of time, and there may be increased tears as the fabric gets thinner. But the profile is decreasing with newer generations. We used to have to do different uh, adjuncts in order to get the devices up, um, but these have become less and less. But we still do occasionally do angioplasty, sometimes do a, a bare metal self-expanding stent for focal areas of, of stenosis. Very rarely do an open conduit nowadays, but this is an option. So a retroperitoneal incision where you get to the iliac bifurcation, so a graft on, uh, and then you can deliver through that. Or an endoconduit, and the traditional endoconduit, people use, use endoconduit uh, the term a lot, but a real endoconduit would be a covered stent um, that really crosses the hypogastric origin and you're essentially intentionally rupturing the iliac artery the whole way in order to deliver your device. So again, something we used to do for it pretty frequently, but pretty rarely do these days. And then I added in here common femoral artery disease. Uh, obviously this may keep you from doing a percutaneous approach and may mandate that you actually patch the artery in order to uh, prevent access site complications. So other anatomic challenges, uh, the distal landing zone is important. And again, something that technology has improved uh, our ability to stretch these limits a little bit as time has gone on. So with aneurysmal common iliac arteries, you don't have a distal landing zone in traditional fashion. So your options are to uh, one of many things. We have a lot of options these days. Um, coil and cover, use bell bottom limbs, use an IBD device. Uh, you can use a hypergastric by bypass or a transposition. You can flip a limb. And again, these are things that the last few things are things we don't do that frequently anymore. Um, snorkel something or fenestrate a limb. So I think most people would decide between coil and cover and a an, uh, fenestrated device. I mean, not a fenestrated, but an IBE these days, unless they can get away with a bell bottom limb. But a coil, coil and cover, the risk is mainly um, uh, in the hypergastric territory for ischemia. Uh, buttock and thigh claudication are pretty common. Uh, I usually quote a patient around 30 percent. Um, and it's pretty uh, common to have. Some of them will go away, uh, but in a lot of patients, it actually is persistent, um, although maybe not limiting. Erectile dysfunction, ischemic colitis, gluteal and perineal necrosis, and spinal cord injury are obviously also associated with this potentially. The risks are increased with bilateral uh, coil and covering, so we try to avoid that uh, in most instances these days. There is an elevated risk of limb occlusion uh, when you're going into the external iliac artery because typically the external iliac has a smaller diameter and so the risk of limb occlusion rates are higher uh, in studies. And the SVS guidelines uh, do recommend preservation of flow to at least one internal iliac artery uh, as, as most people commonly practice. And then if you do have to do bilateral, um, most, they recommend that you stage it. And this is something that we used to do, again, more frequently. But the thought is that you increase your collateral uh, circulation uh, ever so much, ever so slightly by uh, staging, and therefore minimize your risk of colonic ischemia and the other uh, more uh, risky things. So the bell bottom limbs, um, this is one that they've uh, increased with time as well. So the ability to treat uh, larger diameter iliac arteries, the different diameters that are available are listed here. And it's technically feasible in a lot of, a lot of instances and you can continue to preserve your hypogastric. The question is, is are we landing into degenerated artery? And this is gonna um, be echoed with the aortic neck um, issues. So you always have to wonder whether or not you're doing the right thing for the patient. Uh, by landing into a potentially compromised artery. However, in most instances, depending upon the length of the iliac artery, you can probably get away with it. Although I would say in a short iliac artery, when you're doing this, it's, that's the patient that's gonna come back with a 1B uh, in the future. Again, all anatomy. Uh, the iliac branch device is something that uh, I think most institutions have started using. Um, there's a gore and a, and a cook version. The cook version is not currently available in the United States. 
but the GORA uh, excluder ILEI branch device is, and uh, we use it not infrequently. This is just the technical aspects of it. You do have to get a reasonably large sheath up and over the aortic bifurcation. So this is potentially a limitation factor. There's obviously other anatomic specifications um, that you have to meet in order for this device to be possible. And the internal iliac artery has to have a sufficient landing zone as well. And you have to have a lack of circumferential calcification at the iliac bifurcation um, in order to allow two limbs to kind of go through that area. But when it works out, it works very well. And uh, we've seen a very good rate of limb patency um, with this device uh, over time and, and have implanted quite a few of them and have pretty long follow up with a lot of them as well. So just some more pictures of that device. Um, this was a patient where we coiled and covered one side just because uh, anatomic specifications were not um, sufficient on, on the contralateral side, even though it was aneurysmal. Uh, again, this is maybe historical fiction, but hypogastric bypass, uh, we actually quizzed our fellow on that this morning at our case conference, um, something we used to do more frequently where you would extend the um, iliac limb into the external iliac artery and then take a, a bypass limb uh, off through a retroperitoneal incision and swing it down to the internal iliac artery. It's kind of technically challenging, particularly in a um, obese patient, you're really digging in, you know, you're trying to sew into a deep hole. Um, However, uh, limb patency is excellent, um, although you do have the challenges of opening up the retroperitoneum and you have some potential for increased bleeding, longer OR time, um, and uh, other, other potential things that you're adding to the case, obviously. Um, however, it does keep a patient from having buttock claudication compared to coil embolization and covering. And lastly, again, probably not something that's done that frequently anymore, but you can fenestrate an iliac limb um, and essentially just like an IBE device would, uh, would do, ex except get a limb out into the uh, internal iliac artery, uh, similar to a FIVAR. This may, this may overcome the device specifications of the need for a, a more generous uh, proximal common iliac artery um, that I'm pointing my arrow to here. Um, however, that might be the only indication for it uh, in the modern area if the IBE is available. And then you can go really off book and decide to make up your own devices. Um, we have certainly have done AUIs uh, with um, plugging of the common iliac artery and allowing for retrograde perfusion of the hypergastric from, your fem, from a fem fem showing that there. Um, sometimes we will forego putting the coils in the common iliac artery and put a uh, stent uh, from the external into the hypergastric artery uh, and that actually works pretty well as well um, and the stents are able to take that turn uh, pretty well and they and they do stay patent although uh, obviously there is uh, probably a higher rate of uh, hypergastric artery occlusion with that um, dependent upon the patient's anatomy. All right, so this is the wake up midway, uh, more than midway through. Uh, the other uh, iliac, or, I mean, excuse me, the other anatomic challenges that I wanted to go over are probably most important these days is the hostile neck um, and maybe the, the surreptitious hostile neck because you don't always recognize that it's maybe not going to be the best uh, quality tissue to land a device into. But typically, when we say hostile neck, we're talking about thrombus, the angle, and those reverse conical diameter changes. So angulated necks, um, there's uh, 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 two different angles that you need to take into account. So the suprarenal angle and the infrarenal angle. Most devices specify the infrarenal angle, although some actually specify both. But you have to know your device, uh, kind of the way that they manipulate themselves in the body to know which one's going to work best for a patient for specific angles. An angulated neck is probably going to decrease your functional neck length. Um, as you see, the inner to outer diameter is going to change. So you may be measuring on a center line, but you have to take into account what that inner diameter is going to be, or excuse me, what that inner length is. Uh, and uh, that may change your uh, whether or not you're actually doing something that's technically on IFU or not. 
and you might have to increase the diameter and your oversizing in order to accommodate for that because that angle is going to be uh, taken up by the graft material. And again, this is going back to the IFUs. So again, the IFUs for these and the Lombard, um, I'll specify, is not available in the United States now, um, but that did have a neck angulation up to 90 degrees and it worked really well, um, but that was just because of the way that it's made. And since that time, um, since they were first uh, developed, some of the other devices have gone through some um, changes as well. And, and to be quite honest, most of them take neck angulation pretty well, but you do really have to snug up on the renals and you have to know how that's going to really take it and decide on how you're going to manage the deployment. Um, I will frequently um, withdraw my stiff uh, wire, the Lunderquist wire, as I deploy, um, particularly when I'm in an angulated neck, um, to allow it to hug that outer curve as much as possible. So I maximize my neck length uh, when I'm deploying in, in an angulated neck. So along with angulated necks, you have to talk about the short necks. And I, I say that with a caveat, because essentially once you get to a short neck, you're really almost talking about juxtarenal triple A's. Um, but to briefly talk about the endo anchors, so Medtronic um, now owns the Helifix uh, endo anchors um, and the, the anchor registry um, has shown that this works pretty well and that was uh, allowed them to decrease the neck uh, length requirement for their IFU uh, technically. So it's able to uh, treat a shorter neck length if, you're, if you incorporate the endo anchors uh, with the Medtronic device, although you can use the endo anchors with other devices as well. So technical success in the registry was, 90, uh, was 89% and they used an uh, average of five and a half staples uh, and had a mean neck length of seven millimeters in that. So not necessarily endorsing that, just showing that these um, devices are now kind of starting to bridge the gap and, and push the limits. So I think that neck quality is something that you don't always notice if you're just doing the diameter measurements, um, but you really have to look at a, at, at a 3D reconstruction and really look at a center line and see what the neck actually looks like because you can tell in this one this is truly a juxtarenal aneurysm and the neck quality right near the renals is is not good so in an open uh, if you're fixing this open you probably wouldn't care too much you can probably get a good sewing ring just below the renals and it's probably not going to be something that comes back to be an issue in the future uh, of this patient however if you're trying to seal into that aneurysm um, uh, with an EVAR, then that is something that's going to continue to degenerate and you're going to find that that's a patient you're going to get your type 1s. So you really have to take into effect the, the net quality when you're deciding on endo versus open repair. So just on the next selection, I mean, it's really, you know, as these devices have, have started to push the envelope, um, we're really seeing that uh, we're treating juxtarenal uh, pathologies with endovascular means and you know that's fine if you're if you're doing some type of fenestrated mechanism then you're really sealing into good quality aorta um, but I would caution against using just a bigger and bigger device um, because you're really going to find that that's going to be the failure mode and you really need to make sure again that you're sealing and fixating into a healthy um, aorta and, and these tenants don't, don't necessarily apply for open uh, repair and it's, it's interesting that you don't really see that same degenerative effect long term with the open, but it's really just because you're taking away uh, the majority of the aneurysm, whereas the failure mechanism with EVAR um, is due to the fact that you can lose that seal. But endovascular technologies still have a role um, because particularly maybe in the visceral, in the paravisceral segment, um, the, the endovascular benefit may actually be more substantial compared to open. Um, due to the uh, increased morbidity and mortality surrounding open repairs of these. Um, and so the, the perioperative outcomes and that perioperative benefit that we saw for infrarenal EVAR um, is probably even more divergent for juxtarenal and thoracoabdominal uh, device, uh, uh, pathologies. So the aorta is easy to operate on. The problem is that it's, very, it's in a very inconvenient location. 
So if you're going to go for the true thoracal abdominal aneurysm repair, you're talking about a large incision. You have to really um, get into the retroperitoneal space, and it obviously carries with it a, a huge uh, morbidity and mortality for a patient. So treating these with endovascular uh, devices definitely does seem uh, enticing. Uh, so thus the evolution of EVAR for these, uh, you know, increasing paravisceral uh, aneurysms. Obviously, we started with open surgery, and then a hybrid open and endovascular surgery came onto the, uh, into the fray. Chimneys and snorkel devices, um, EVAR adjuncts and better devices, um, different types of cuffs and whatnot that uh, allowed us to kind of uh, uh, shorten the neck uh, in EVARs and then homemade fenestrations, and finally custom-made devices. So I'm not going to get into the true thoracal abdominal uh, repairs, uh, but we'll talk about uh, ZFEN fever. So fee the Cook ZFEN, um, as we all know, is a, is a custom-made device um, that you have to have specific anatomic specifications for, um, but usually can treat um, up to and seal um, uh, up to and, and even above the superior mesenteric artery, however, without uh, support of the superior mesenteric artery um, in most instances. So, But two-thirds of patients um, with complex abdominal aortic aneurysms won't be candidates for the ZFEN due to the design constraints. And as mentioned, so you can have a maximum of three fenestrations um, so two small and one large, and the large would be non-reinforced, or you can have uh, fenestrations and scallop and a scallop. Um, but the diameters are all kind of fixed. The, you know, you, you obviously are going to uh, make the fenestrations where you want to from an anatomical um, uh, uh, three-dimensional reconstruction. However, you can't have them uh, as close together as you would like in some instances, and there's definitely limitations that you can't get around um, due to the custom-made device of it. So it may not necessarily be uh, the best thing to treat uh, and get seal all the way up to uh, and through the celiac, and so you might not always have the rest, best seal that you want. But in juxtarenal pathologies, typically um, this will get you uh, where you need to go. Um, and, and probably is something that you should consider even in the really short um, neck uh, that's not, a, not really a, um, a juxtarenal pathology. But there is a manufacturing time of about six weeks. They've gotten it down uh, nowadays to about four weeks, but you can't al always rely on that. And so they're still made in Australia uh, and then shipped over. So we usually uh, give us about four, six weeks for that. Um, in an angulated, uh, paravisceral segment. It may be hard to plan these because you know that you're going to be putting up a stiff wire and so the fenestrations may not necessarily be able to uh, line up the way you want them to. Um, you can usually uh, get into the devices, I mean into the um, renal arteries, but sometimes when you've got aneurysmal pathology right at the uh, renals, and particularly when, you, when it goes above the renals, then you're talking about having to bridge the distance with um, the bridging stent. And that may not, from a me mechanical or an engineering uh, standpoint, hold up. And you might end up finding that you either have stent fractures or type 3 endoleaks from the devices pulling out uh, from one another because of the stress uh, factors. I don't think that, you know, these devices are not uh, necessarily made to uh, withstand uh, any uh, migration of the devices or the constant pulsations and, and blood pressure uh, that we see. And it's really hard to anticipate exactly what's going to happen over time. Um, when you've got tortuous iliac arteries, it's difficult to necessarily get your fenestrations um, uh, aligned in the right manner. It's very difficult to, you know, kind of uh, torque uh, on the device and get things uh, moved around the way you want to. And there's no low profile, low profile system for this uh, as of yet, and so you still need to have pretty generous access vessels. And then again, the, the problem with ongoing degeneration of your paravisceral segment or your pararenal segment and the fact that after this device goes in, you have limited bailout options. And I'll just list all these. The significance of failures is, is it, it starts to get a little bit more real. Um, obviously, failures in EVAR can be uh, real, but it seems to be um, once, you, once you start to get into the visceral segment, it's, a, it's uh, uh, ramifications are, are greater. Reinterventions are obviously higher. 
um, when you're treating juxtarenal pathologies. Um, and I would say that they're much higher in uh, endovascular compared to open techniques as well. So that kind of gets you into why can't we always use EVAR or FIVAR, even though we've gotten so good with all this technology and we've uh, overcome the limitations of the iliac problems and maybe the neck problems. Um, but as I mentioned, some of those different failure modes, um, I would also include that there's sometimes a patient that you've got an IMA that you really don't want to um, occlude. And so that patient you would need to do an open repair in. And then there's other patient factors. I mentioned the younger patients don't get as much of a benefit from EVAR. And so that might be the patient that you decide to go straight to open. And we know that you can do so in a, in a pretty low, uh, with a low mortality and morbidity. The surveillance compliant, you have to have an, a patient that's gonna be willing to do uh, CT surveillance um, essentially for a life. Um, and so that patient needs to know uh, that they're not truly fixed um, unless they're actually coming back for their uh, routine uh, uh, surveillance with you. There's a radiation risk obviously associated with the ongoing uh, CT surveillance. You can probably switch to ultrasound at some point, um, but not necessarily all protocols um, have gone to that yet. There's obviously a cost difference between EVAR and open, and the lifetime cost is probably um, much greater with EVAR um, because of also you add in all the CAT scans. And remediation bailout limitations, um, uh, there, there may be uh, con open conversion seems like an easy thing if you've got a device that's got infrarenal fixation um, and the stents come out easily. Uh, from the aorta, but when you're talking about all the different devices, particularly when you uh, go up into the pararenal segment, um, it's even more difficult. So that's why we still do a pretty high volume of open repair here, because you can't always make uh, an EVAR work. So the different open strategies, uh, when you're talking predominantly about juxtarenal AAAs, uh, we use a lot of retroperitoneal exposure. Um, we don't typically do left renal vein ligation, but I just add that in there as a strategy potentially if you need to get higher in, the, in a transperitoneal fashion. You can use a posterior bevel to kind of overcome that proximal neck, that posterior degeneration that you see frequently. Left renal bypass is, is pretty commonly used when you've got true juxtarenal pathology if you need to uh, get your sewing ring a little bit higher. And I'll just leave with this. This is a 69 year old male. He had a six and a half centimeter AAA when he uh, came to us. I'll go line by line. He had hypertension, hyperlipidemia, he's obese. However, then we also found out he's a current smoker. He's COPD on nocturnal uh, oxygen. So it starts to look a little less rosy, even though he's only 69. It's also on Lasix, but we didn't have a recent echo. Um, however, looking back through his records, he had a negative MPS a couple of years ago and didn't endorse any angina, um, but also wasn't that active. So initially, this is his uh, 3D reconstruction. If you're just looking at it in this view, you look and you say, well, that neck doesn't look, it looks like it actually could have enough length for seal. Um, and you might convince yourself that you could get some, an infrarenal device to seal there. Same in looking at just the diameters, you see these are about 15 uh, uh, millimeters apart, these two diameters, going from the renal to what you would actually call the neck. So this is about 13, 14 uh, millimeters from, from that lowest renal to uh, this slice here. However, when you look at the alternative view, you see that posterior uh, degeneration there. And so really that entire thing is aneurysmal degeneration. If you had looked at the diameters on those, that was, they measured 33, 34 right at that renal. So obviously that's not good aorta there. And so you need to go ahead and, and make sure that you're sealing into something that's a little bit higher. So this seemed like a pretty good instance where you could use a Z-Fen and increase your seal to this area here that looks almost normal, obviously still not completely normal, but almost normal. And so we thought that would be a good idea. The case went well, didn't have any uh, issues in the case. We had a great final image. Um, everything looked good. Again, this is our one month post-op CT scan here showing that the renals looked good and there was good seal throughout this whole area here from essentially above the SMA um, down through the renals we had seal. 
So at six months, this actually, he, he somehow didn't come back for his three month. We, we lost his three month scan. Uh, and then at six months, we found that he had this. So the uh, aneurys, the aorta is essentially degenerating around the renals here. And it didn't take long. It's, I mean, that's, you know, five months in, in happening. And this renal essentially pulled, almost pulled out of the uh, renal artery and occluded, that renal artery essentially occluded at that time. Um, and we didn't feel that there was really any remediation uh, available because it had already happened and his uh, creatinine had gone up uh, several months prior to this without us being aware of it. And again, he missed the follow-up. I'm sorry, I've got to be able to see my image. And then this was his nine-month post-op. Again, not usually a nine-month scan that we get, but um, this uh, was obtained in him because of that six-month scan. And you see this ongoing degeneration. And he actually had developed a type 1 endoleak from the SMA scallop here. So whereas he had had really good seal up here uh, on his one-month scan, all of it degenerated ra very rapidly. Um, and he had now, uh, you know, almost a seven, seven centimeter aneurysm and, and a wide open endoleak. So somebody that we wouldn't have predicted. So he underwent EVAR conversion with the left renal bypass. Just thought that was an important one to show just because it was such a surprise. So any questions? Nobody's sent any through from the chat. Um, in order to be able to stretch the limits of what you think you, you're available to use. I've got a, a group that refers to me and they're a group of interventional uh, cardiologists and they only use one device. And so they'll refer um, cases that the rep says, don't do my, don't use my device in because this, this won't work well. Um, and they'll refer those up, but it's just, it seems odd that, you know, in this day and age with such a, a variety of devices that um, you know not to just know know them all and we try to get a, you know a, a good variety of use in so we can teach our fellows the different devices and I think it's important so if you are already an institution that has a real favorite that's fine but you still need to know the the mechanisms and the failure modes of the other ones as well that's great uh, thank you for your talk it was very comprehensive and helpful um, I think Nathan Kogler has a question. Do you mind just reading it out loud? Yeah, Nathan asks, could you comment on iliac degeneration with bell bottom and how you approach your sizing if unable to utilize IBE? Um, you know, again, they they do have, um, you know, specifications up to, you know, the diameters are up to 28 now in certain devices. Um, that doesn't mean that I'll always want to do that um, in a patient. And so I, I think I would preferentially do an IVE sometimes in a patient, depending upon if, if, again, if the entire common iliac artery is aneurysmal, then that scares me um, that that might, you know, have ongoing degeneration. And so if that happens, then there's nowhere to go um, once you have that, that bell bottom in if it, if it does develop a type 1B. From ongoing degeneration, it's hard to it's hard to predict who that's going to happen to. I think you just get a sense of, you know, uh, the different people, patients, pathologies as as you go through this, um, and you've got your own biases. I think, and trying to put it on paper and say exactly why we make decisions is not necessarily um, something I'm, I would be good at. But um, sometimes you'll see that the that there actually is seal uh, a seal zone in the proximal condyliac, and the diameter will be almost more normal, and then it gets a little bit. Uh, wider and so that's actually probably a good use of an iliac bell bottom um, because even if that area degenerated a little bit you probably are still going to maintain your seal more proximally and so that probably won't get, become a wide open 1B. Um, Melissa asked um, that I mentioned type 1 uh, leaks with neck placement and choice um, and then what other type of endo leaks should we be aware of with particular devices. So I didn't go into specifics. The AFX device has been known to have a higher rate of type 3 endoleaks. Um, most of that is uh, predominantly from an older generation of the fabric um, and from the stent structure on the AFX is inside the graft rather than outside as the other ones. And so just with the constant pulsation, the thought is maybe the 
uh, areas where it's sutured into the material, um, it pull, pulls the material away from the stent structure and so pulls a hole um, in the uh, actual EVAR fabric. Um, that typically happens near the bifurcation, probably just due to the flow mechanism through that area. Um, so the type 3 endo leaks with AFX is obviously a little bit, and then also the AFX also has a cuff and a main body. Uh, and unless you maximize the overlap with tortuosity, those can pull out of one another. That can actually happen with any EVAR um, modular device. So as aneurysms continue to degenerate and they become more tortuous, then that turn can cause type 3 endo leaks between the different devices. Um, that's pretty rare to happen to, uh, you know, result in a, a wide open type 3, but it can happen. Obviously more common with juxtarenal and different thoracal abdominal pathologies. Um, ongoing type 2 endo leaks um, are kind of the crux of uh, some people's <laughs> practice with these surveillance um, images. And I think it's very difficult to predict who's going to have an ongoing type 2 window leak that's going to be a problem. Typically, you'll need inflow and outflow um, in those. And um, I coil a lot of the type 2s, and, and I still don't have a great understanding of why some stay open and why don't, some don't. Um, but that probably puts us at our time. I could talk about type 2 window leaks all day, but nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> uh, Sounds good. Do you, um, do you mind just going pretty briefly about what are your kind of tips and tricks for those difficult gate cannulations? Um, you know, um, it's not infrequent that we have those very large aneurysms that, that are within IFU and we're using an and the infrarenal device and just struggling to get that gate. So can mm -hmm. you just kind of go over to, to our fellows and residents? Yeah, so catheters and wires are kind of the key to that. I typically only use a stiff glide wire but obviously you can choose to use other types of wires, um, but it's really the catheter choice, I think, that gets you uh, maneuverability to, to that gate cannulation. So um, I'll typically just start with a, with a Compi. A C2 might uh, be the second choice, um, but a Vanshee, uh, is it Vanshee 5? Um, is actually the, my kind of my go-to when I can't get over there. Um, it's, it's kind of a hooked, it's got a reverse hook, and so it allows you to essentially spin um, and it can really get you over into corners that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get into. Um, so that's kind of my go-to for that. If you really can't get there, you can, um, you can snare uh, from up and over. Um, you could even use a, a, a deflectable, a steerable sheath, but I, have, I haven't done that. You can come from the arm, um, all those different techniques. Uh, my usual, so I'll usually try the different catheters, and then if that doesn't work, I'll typically actually push on the abdomen and try to uh, manipulate the aorta uh, to where I want it to go. Um, that's a little bit of a risky maneuver potentially, but usually it helps a little bit, and if it doesn't, then you can go to your other mechanisms. Can you uh, what is your approach to larger caliber IMAs? Do you ever prophylactically coil embolize? You know, we talk about it, but I have to say I really never do. There's, you know, every once in a while I'll see one and I'll, I'll decide that well, I would think about coiling uh, that one when I look at the, the 3D recon. But to be honest, I, I actually have not done that in the past five years, I would say. Um, so I, I and it may be my bailout because I'll always, you know, I, I know that I can always go back later if it if it becomes a problem and, you know, go through a trans cable route uh, or one of the other uh, routes, IMA or SMA to IMA, which I really don't do. But, um, yeah, I, I kind of think about my bailout. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Christina. This was great. Uh, we will share the uh, recording with you as well. And for those that want it, we can just, uh, you can just email us so that we can send it your way. Uh, thank you for taking the time for doing this. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Thanks. Bye.